The human body is more than half water. A baby's body is more like three quarters water. And this means that for an adult who weighs about 170 pounds, 100 pounds is just water weight. 70 pounds is, you know, the bones and the brains and the other kinds of things. But that means that the most essential part of our daily diet is water. Water is necessary for the transport system in our bodies. First, in digestion, I need more water. Talking about it makes me <laughs> Water is necessary for the transport system in our bodies, first in digestion, and then to carry those nutrients throughout our body, uh, the oxygen to every cell. Water is necessary to wash out the waste, to keep our bodies clean inside and outside. Water lubricates our bodies, it keeps our joints slick and our skin supple. It keeps our temperature even, especially in the summer when our cooling system of sweat is activated. Thank you so much. Without water, our bodies quickly become dehydrated. There's an interesting fact for you, just a 2% decrease of water in our bodies. That's for that 170 pound person I was talking about. Two pounds would just be uh, two, a 2% decrease would be about two pounds less of water. That's not even a quart. So just that 2% decrease in water in your body causes a 20% decrease in mental and physical performance. Luckily, your body gives you warning signs when you need water. Thirst is one of them. By the time you recognize your thirst, however, you're often well on your way to being dehydrated. Signs of needing water include a dry mouth, dry skin, a headache, getting dizzy, confused, even fainting. Our hearts and souls get dehydrated too. Our Creator wired us, not just with signs that signal physical thirst and dehydration, but also signs that signal emotional and spiritual dehydration. Dehydrated souls exhibit irritability, worry, anxiety, sleeplessness, or loneliness. Spiritual dehydration causes hopelessness and guilt, fear, dissatisfaction, just a sense of longing for something more, symptoms of a deep dryness within. Just as we often confuse our physical thirst for other kinds of problems maybe in our bodies, so often we can also confuse the signs of spiritual thirst. I'm sorry. <laughs> we often call our spiritual thirst stress. In his book, Come Thirsty, Max Lucado writes, stress signals a deeper need, a longing, a thirst. Are there signs of thirst in your life? We can see evidence of spiritual thirst all around us. We see it in the increasing isolation and loneliness of people today. It's being called an epidemic. We can see it in the tragedy in Darien this week. There was a thirst for relationship, for love, for control, for power that could not be satisfied. And the longing to find relief from pain, emotional or physical, can become a desperate thirst that leads people to drugs or violence, to all sorts of things that harm themselves and harm others. Thirst 
is your body's way to draw you to water, to invite you to drink. In Jesus, God experienced thirst. Jesus felt thirsty and asked a woman for water. Jesus looked and could see a thirsty soul, a thirst that came from brokenness in her personal relationships, from fears that brought her to the well at noon rather than when the rest of the community would have gathered first thing in the morning. Perhaps also a thirst that came from questions about worship and about God. I believe it was the poet Henry David Thoreau who wrote that most people lead lives of quiet desperation. Jesus sees that thirst within us. He sees the thirst within you. Jesus knows your deepest longings, knows your heart, and invites you, as he did that woman, saying, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. We need to treat our souls as we treat our thirst. We need to take a gulp flood our hearts with a good swallow of satisfying water. Where do we find water for our souls? The Bible contains several invitations to those who are thirsty. 700 years before Jesus sat next to a well and asked for a drink because he was thirsty, the prophet Isaiah shared a message from God, and God spoke an invitation. Is anyone thirsty? Come to the waters and drink. Even if you have no money, come. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that doesn't give you strength? Why pay for food that's no good? Listen to me. Eat what is good. Come and listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting agreement with you, God said. I will give you the same unfailing love that I promised to King David. And Jesus then issued that same invitation, not just to that woman at the well, but a few chapters later in John's Gospel, this time, rather than being in the territory of the Samaritan outsiders, Jesus is right in the heart of the city of Jerusalem, in the courtyard of the temple, in the center of Jewish worship of the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And Jesus was there to be a part of an annual festival called the Festival of Tabernacles. It was a remembrance of God's goodness to the people during their years of wandering in the desert. They were living in tabernacles, in tents. <coughs> they got very thirsty. <laughs> they remembered those years when they were free from e slavery in Egypt before they got to the Promised Land. And one of the particular events that they commemorate during the Festival of Tabernacles is how God provided water for the people in that dry desert land. Once when their water was all gone and they were so thirsty that they thought they would all die, the people begged Moses for water. And Moses cried out to God in prayer and God directed Moses to gather the people at this big rock face and to take his staff and whack that rock with it and out of the rock then flowed living water, clean, refreshing water that revived them all. And so at this annual festival of tabernacles, they celebrated God's provision of life-giving water by having the priest go to a special spray and fill up a jug of water and then bring it into the temple and pour it out over the altar. And the priest would do this every day for the seven days of the festival. And then on the last and final day of that festival, the priest would go out and fill many, many pitchers with water. And they would bring it in and pour it out over the altar again and again and again. 
and that water is flowing down and running across the floor. Maybe a little bit like when the rain came pouring into our sanctuary uh, just 10 days ago or so. I want you to listen to John chapter 7 uh, that tells that bit of that story. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood in the temple courtyard and shouted out, Is anyone thirsty? Let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. John then adds an explanation, saying, by this, Jesus meant the Spirit, that up to that time, those who believed in him had not yet received, because Jesus was not yet glorified, but they would receive it later. The Holy Spirit was the gift of God that Jesus poured out on his disciples, the gift that would quench our thirst Quench that deep thirst in our souls. Being a believer doesn't mean we won't ever get thirsty again. At the temple during the festival, Jesus is talking to religious folks, to people who are there to worship God. And so having religion or believing in God is not a once and for all cure for thirstiness. Just like if you stand in the middle of Lake Michigan doesn't replace drinking water. Our bodies continue to experience physical thirst if we don't drink, and our souls will continue to experience thirst too if we don't drink in God's presence and love each day. Instead, thirst invites. It draws us into the ever-flowing, running water of God's love and care, providing for our souls the kind of nourishment that truly satisfies and truly addresses our deepest need. When I get up in the morning, there are days when the first thing I reach for is my phone, and I can get pulled into 30 minutes of reading my news feed about all the events that happened the day before and the things that happened while I was sleeping and predictions of what's going to happen in the day ahead. And on those days, I often end up feeling parched, feeling sad and discouraged and stressed. But on other days, I resist the pull of the news feed, and I spend 30 minutes listening to God's voice first as I read the Bible and silently drink in God's love and God's presence. And on those days, I feel ready to face the day because the nutrients of God's love have carried, been carried to my heart to give strength. And my attitude has been softened and is supple. And my emotional temperature is better regulated throughout the day. But these aren't all the things that happen when we take time to drink from living water of Christ's presence and, in, and come and answer that invitation from the Spirit to be filled up. It's not just about how I benefit. I'll never forget how Rick Warren begins his book, The Purpose Driven Life. He begins with these words, it's not about you. It's not about you. In that invitation in Isaiah 55, that I read a few minutes ago, that all who are thirsty should come and drink, God goes on to explain, I see, see how I use you to display my powers among the peoples. Nations you do not know, people unknown to you, will come running because I, the Lord your God, have made you glorious. Our well-watered lives are to draw in other thirsty people to God and invite them to find the water that truly gives life. What amazes me about what Jesus says about this gift of life-giving water isn't that I should go to him and find it. I believe, I know that to be true. What really stuns me is that he goes on to add that when I do, my life 
will become a spring, a river, through which the life-giving water will flow out to others and will flow out to water the world around me. Isaiah 58, it continues, God says, if you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, stop pointing the finger and spreading malicious talk, and if you share your food with the hungry, and if you satisfy the needs of the down and out, then you will become like a well-watered garden, like a gurgling spring that never runs dry. The Samaritan woman's response to Jesus' life-giving presence is a picture of what Jesus says satisfied his hunger and his thirst. She generously left behind her water jug for a weary group of Jewish men. And as that living water bubbled up inside her and bubbled up into her life, she rushed back to the village. And she began to share her discovery of God's Messiah, her discovery of the Savior of the world with everyone in her community. And she invited them to come and meet him. On the final page, of the Bible in those final verses of Revelation, that invitation is heard again. Revelation 22, 17 says, the spirit and the bride, and that bride is the church, that bride is us. The spirit and the bride say, come. Everyone should echo, come, are you thirsty? Come, come and drink. Anyone who wants may drink from the free gift of the waters of life. Will you allow the gift of living water to slake your thirst today? How is it going to flow out through you to water the people around you? People unknown to you. People who are, whose parched lives need that water to be satisfied. Who will you invite to come and drink the free water of life. For the next four Sundays, we're going to continue to think about Christ's offer of living water and to drink more deeply from the well of Christ's work, to drink from the well of the energy of God's Spirit, to drink from the well of Christ's Lordship over our lives and God's unending, unfailing life. So may you uh, come for these next few Sundays as we're focusing more about what this offer of living water does. You can fill up your jug of water so that you can take it to water those who may never come to our congregation to worship with us. Or you can invite them to come and find out what this living water is about as well. The praise team, I want to invite them to come back up. We're going to close with a song.